Thank you all for coming on what's not a terribly sunny day, but I promise you're going to see plenty of sun in here. If I would ask you to draw a picture of the sun, you'd probably all draw something like the big yellow ball that's on the screen. Most of you would probably add some rays on a sunny day. The picture that's on the screen here is what the sun looks like in visible light. That's the light we can see as human beings. However, for me, and for people who are working in solar physics, we tend to probably more think of the sun as this. This is a picture of the sun in extreme ultraviolet. It shows the sun's atmosphere, and the particular picture here shows temperature somewhere between one and two million degrees. Okay, it's a mixture of colors representing slightly different temperatures. And this is what I'm going to be talking about mostly. I'm going to start at the interior of the sun, but I'm mostly going to talk about the sun's atmosphere. Following me, if on Ellsworth, we'll talk more about the interior of the sun. So you will learn about that as well. OK, well, let's have a think. The sun as a star is actually not particularly interesting. As astronomers think of it as a very ordinary star, it's about middle-aged. We think it's roughly halfway through its expectant life. Uh, so we have a while to go. We're somewhere here. Oops, I shouldn't point with that thing, should I? We're somewhere here in the middle of the sun's kind of lifespan. This is a, an illustration of the Milky Way, and the sun sits out in one of the spiral arms. Now, for us, it is, of course, a special star. It's the reason why we are here, and it's special because it's so close to us. But you may well find out from Lindsay Fletcher's talk later on that there are other reasons why it may be special. As a scientist, of course, the sun is special because it's the only star we can see in great detail. It's the only star that's more than just a point source in the sky. So let's have a look at it. The sun's powerhouse is right in the very center. Its nuclear core, where the nuclear reactions take place, converting hydrogen into helium. And as that happens, this process, there's a very small amount of energy. Well, when I say it's a very small amount, it's a whopping great big amount of energy that's released. And this depicts the full process, but really the outcome is that you convert hydrogen into helium and a small amount of energy is released. And there are some numbers here, and they're just very, very huge quantities. But what's important is this little bit of excess energy. This is a picture, or this is a cartoon, it's not a picture, of what the inside of the sun looks like. There is a core, which I've just talked about, which is where these nuclear reactions take place. And then there's another zone above that, which we call the radiative zone, where energy is transferred by radiation. And then above that, there is a layer called the convection zone. And there, the material is bubbling almost as if it's like a pot of boiling water, it's bubbling up. And you can see these temperatures, we go from about 16, 15, 16 million in the core, and then the temperature gradually comes down until the surface, which you can see just at the edges here, we'll look at it again in a minute, is about six to six and a half thousand degrees. Okay, and that's the surface from which the radiation that we see here is emitted. Now remember that little bit of energy I talked about? Well, that bit of energy is released or emitted as gamma rays from the core. However, as it travels outwards, it loses energy as it travels through the interior of the sun until eventually the energy level gives us visible light. Now, if you're an energetic particle released here, you don't actually know where the surface is, do you? These particles just bounce around randomly until eventually through a random walk and bouncing around, they make their way out to the surface. And this process actually takes about 100,000 years. So in a way, you could think of the light that we're seeing just before you came in as being about 100,000 years old, 
already, and a few minutes, which it takes <laughs> to travel to us. So this is the interior of the sun, and I'm not really going to talk much more about it, but Yvonne will come back to some of these things. This is the surface, or this is quick, that you just saw, but it's going to loop through a few times. However, as you go up in the atmosphere, the sun, strangely enough, the temperature starts to rise again. Remember, I talked about the temperature at the core being about 15 million, and then it kind of comes down gradually to 6,000 degrees as you get to the surface. Well, if you keep going outwards into the atmosphere of the sun, you can see that from 6,000, it climbs to about, well, it actually dips just a little bit, but then it goes up to 10, 100, and then it goes up to temperatures well in excess of a million degrees. So let's see if we can go through this again. The first image you see is the, see, is the image we're used to. I'll come back to that image in a minute. As it heats up, it starts emitting in extreme and ultraviolet, ex sorry, ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet, and eventually in X-rays. This picture, the black and white one, again, it's going to loop through a few times, this shows magnetic field. And the white and the black shows magnetic field towards the Earth and away from the Earth, so kind of going in and out of this screen. And what I would like you to look at, as this movie loops around a few more times, is how these bright bits in the outer atmosphere of the sun coincides with regions of black and white. We know that these bright bits of the atmosphere are regions where the magnetic field is particularly strong. Now, this is a way of representing the temperature. It's the same as the kind of schematic here. This shows distance above the surface of the sun, which we call the photosphere. And this shows the temperature. And what's remarkable is that this increase in temperature actually happens very, very quickly, or over a very short distance. This temperature manages to climb from 6,000 to 1 million degrees. And scientists have been pondering this for quite a while now and refer to it as the coronal heating problem. Now, I talked about this magnetic field, and we do know that somehow the energy needed to heat this atmosphere is tied into this magnetic field. This magnetic field, we think, is generated in the interior of the sun and then somehow pops its way through the surface and rises into the atmosphere. Now, I think Yvonne will talk about it a little bit more, but because the atmosphere of the sun doesn't rotate as a solid body, it rotates differentially with the equator rotating slightly faster than the poles, this magnetic field, in a way, gets all tangled up. So what does this look like? This is just a cartoon. It's showing this convection layer that I talked about, where this really hot material is rising and then falling. And it's showing these magnetic field lines popping through the surface and making these huge magnetic loops. And the place where they pop through the surface and go back down, that is sunspots. Sunspots are regions where the magnetic field is really, really strong and breaks through the surface. Now, convection, of course, means that this field doesn't sit still. This field is anchored below the surface of the sun in this very buoyant convective layer, meaning that this magnetic field is constantly being moved and jiggled around. And we'll see some consequences of that in a minute. OK, well, let's have a look at some of these uh, phenomena that I've been mentioning in a bit more detail. This is a picture of the surface of the sun, as we would see it, but you, you shouldn't try and, and look at that. It is taken by a telescope. And these black dots that you can see are not specks on the telescopes. They're also not the International Space Station. For those of you who were in yesterday's talks, these are actually sunspots. Okay? And this is a zoom taken by a ground-based telescope, actually, in this case, of one of these sunspots. And on there is a picture of the Earth to scale. Okay? So when we talk about spots, it's a kind of relative term when you are the sun. You can quite happily lose the Earth in some of these bigger ones. 
So these, remember, these black regions are regions where the magnetic field is really, really strong. But there's also this kind of mottled pattern by the side, which I'm going to talk about just now. This mottled pattern is basically the convection below the surface that you can see on the surface. So what this is, let's go to this, let's look at this cartoon. So this is a picture here of, of this mottled surface. And what you have is very hot gas rising, and that where it comes to the surface, gives you these very bright patches. And then as it cools, it sinks again in these kind of dark lanes, almost. And as I said, this is incredibly dynamic, this convection process. And all going well, this should be a movie. So not focusing on the lovely sunspot, but on that kind of pattern of granulation. And you can see this is constantly bubbling. So if you were a magnetic field with your feet anchored in this bubbling, seething mass, you'd struggle to sit still, really. And that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, sunspots and granulation is what we see on the surface of the sun. And the surface we refer to as the photosphere, and it's the layer where we get our visible light from. Now, just above that, so this is a cartoon again, you have the interior of the sun, and the little yellow line is meant to represent the photosphere, a very, very thin layer where we get the visible light from. And above that is another layer called chromosphere. And the reason it is called chromosphere is that very occasionally we can actually see it from the ground. This is a picture of a total solar eclipse. And you can hopefully, I hope it does come across, just see this very, very thin pink layer. Well, that is the chromosphere. What's happening here, by a fantastic coincidence, our moon is the perfect size to block out all the very bright light that normally comes from the photosphere. Okay, that's the light we get. The moon blocks that out, and just around the edge, you can see the chromosphere. Further out, and we will talk about that in a few slides, you can then see the extended solar atmosphere called the corona. So this is a picture in white light. The chromosphere is showing this lovely red ring around the moon. And this is a picture taken by a telescope showing what the chromosphere looks like. And you can see there's all these dark kind of lanes. Lindsay, are you going to mention prominences? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> there's all these bright and dark patches on here, which are again related to features of the magnetic field. Now remember, this magnetic field sits inside this convection layer and does not sit still. And I think that is obvious from this movie. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a small patch of sun. This is the limb of the sun, a kind of black layer you can just see there. You can actually see a sunspot here, but we're looking edge on. Now, the kind of flickering lines you're seeing here are the kind of lower bit of these huge magnetic loops, okay? But higher up, they're hotter. So they're not quite visible in this particular wavelength. So you're only seeing the tiny little legs of huge loops. But what you can see is that they're constantly waving and jiggling about really quite rapidly. And that will be important for the rest of the talk about the outer solar atmosphere. OK, so I've now moved out, and this is a full sun image, to the outer atmospheric layer, which we call the solar corona. And you can see, remember that eclipse picture I showed? It, it kind of looks like a crown, hence the word corona. Now, the corona is full of these huge magnetic loops. And what you're seeing here is very hot gas trapped on these magnetic field lines. Because obviously, you can't see a magnetic field lines. The Earth has a magnetic field, and we're not constantly bumping into lines or seeing lines everywhere. That would be quite annoying uh, if the whole place was stripy all the time. What you're seeing here is gas trapped on the magnetic field. And this particular gas is about 1 million degrees in temperature. And a collection of these loops we refer to as an active region. So you can see that the, the solar corona is full of these huge magnetic loops. This is a cartoon, okay, because obviously we can't go and have a look 
an actual look underneath the surface, but Yvonne will explain how we actually know quite a lot about what goes on below the surface. But this is meant to illustrate these magnetic loops breaking through the surface, where they then form a pair of sunspots, and then you get these huge arching coronal loops. Okay, I think I'll let it play one more time. So we dive, metaphorically, under the surface, where this field is generated by some kind of dynamo. It rises up, breaks through the surface, and forms a pair of sunspots. And then we see these fantastically beautiful loops as outlined here. This particular image is again taken in extreme ultraviolet. Now, you all know that you put sunscreen on to protect yourself from ultraviolet rays, and some of those ultraviolet rays penetrate the Earth's atmosphere, but most of it is actually blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. The same for extreme ultraviolet and X-rays. So these pictures I am showing of gas emitting in extreme ultraviolet and X-rays are all taken by telescopes just outside the Earth's atmosphere because this particular light is not visible from the Earth's surface. Now, remember we had... I'm going to take a slight step back. We had the surface with these sunspots. Now, the number of sunspots changes constantly as time goes on. And what's shown here on this graph is year, and it starts, sorry, it's probably a bit small to read, in 1900, and this particular graph runs to about 2000, 2010. And then really what's just depicted here is the number of sunspots. So you look at the sun, you count the number of sunspots, and you record that number. And people do that all the time. And you can see that the number goes up and down. Sometimes there are more sunspots, and sometimes there are very, very few sunspots. And we refer to this uh, as the solar cycle, the sunspot cycle. And roughly, this period is about 11 years, okay? give or take one, two years. But on average, it's about 11 years. When there are very few sunspots, we refer to it as a solar minimum or a solar maximum when the sun is particularly active and there are a lot of sunspots. So this graph shows the shame, but it just starts in 1980 and it comes up to, I need to update my graph, it's only up till about 2013 in here. But that means you can get an idea where we are just now. Okay, we had a few very big cycles in the 1980s and 90s, but the last few cycles have just been a little bit quieter, okay? And this is a particularly quiet cycle, and we're just, just on the downhill slope, actually, just now. Okay, so the number of sunspots changes. I remember it's the huge magnetic loops breaking through the surface in these sunspots. So what happens to that outer atmosphere? What does it look like as the number of sunspots vary? Well, of course, it looks very, very differently. And this is just a set of images that shows a snapshot, a picture of the outer atmosphere at solar maximum. This was the maximum in 2001, and then all the way around on both sides to a minimum in 1996, and another maximum in 2000 or around 2006. And you can see how dramatically it changes over time. At some times, our solar atmosphere looks extremely bright, and it would be very, very dynamic. There'd be lots of stuff going on. And then other times, well, it just looks a little bit quieter. It's still there, of course, but it just looks a little bit more homogeneous and less, um, and it's less dynamic. Okay, well, I've given you a very broad overview. What I would like you to, do, what I would like to do is just tell you a little bit about what it is that I do, because actually I'm not an observer. I've actually downloaded all these pictures from Google. And you can all download them from Google. Um, I'm actually a theorist. And you can think, well, why do you need, I'm actually a mathematician. What do you need theorists for? You can just look at the sun, can't you? Just look at it. Well, we can, but it's not a controlled experiment. It's not like a physics lab. We can't set it up to do something and then ask it to do it again and again and again. Every time it shows some phenomenon is slightly different. So we try and create models. We try and look at the equations that describe the gas and the magnetic field. And we use this to try and understand the observations. 
because very often the observations only tell us the outcome of a physical process, and it's up to us to understand how the physical process is working. Of course, ultimately, we'd like to try and predict some of the events that happen on the sun and in the solar atmosphere, and you're going to hear quite a lot about that from both Lindsay and Jim later on. Of course, especially effects that might affect the Earth. So we have a fantastic fleet of satellites around, but we do still rely on that kind of theoretical modeling to compare with the observations. And I'm hoping to show you some of these models. Remember, we talked about this cartoon image. You've got the magnetic field generated somewhere down here, we think. We think the magnetic field is generated between that radiative zone and that convective zone in the interior. We think that's where the magnetic field is, is generated by a dynamo. And then it pops through the surface. Well, that's easy, isn't it, if I tell you? Just, it just pops through the surface. Well, it turns out, if you start to model that process, it's not that easy to make it pop through the surface. Well, it is. The sun can do it. We just don't quite understand what's going on there. So this particular simulation is done by a colleague of mine. You have to think of the orange line. Think of the orange line as the surface, a bit of surface, and we're looking side on, if you want. And there's a big bundle of magnetic field. And what my colleague Vasilis is trying is whether he, what happens if he artificially makes this rise. And he does it artificially. He just makes it a bit lighter in the middle and then see what happens. Well, what happens is it's actually quite reluctant to pop through the surface because you can see that most of the red tube actually stays below. So he gets, he gets something that looks a little bit like these huge magnetic loops, but actually the majority of the magnetic field stays below. So that's why we need models. We then look at it, well, why, why doesn't it? The sun is managing. Why is my model not managing? Can we adjust the physics in the model to try and understand what is going on? So that's emerging magnetic flux. Let's start with this movie again. It's on a loop, so it's going to go through a few times. Let's start at the bottom right here. What you can see, it's not in yellow, it's just in black and white this time, is the sun is a big group of sunspots, and outside of it, remember, is that granular pattern, which is black and white flickering bits we saw earlier. In this square up here is the huge magnetic loops that would be in the outer atmosphere. And what you can see here, as it starts again, is as this magnetic field coming through the surface, so this is actually a region that's emerging and evolving, you can see what's going on up in the outer atmosphere. So it's anything but quiet. This thing's constantly moving and jiggling around. And that's probably where the heat is coming from. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So you can see how this active region, what it's called, is constantly changing as it rotates around the sun. So remember, we have magnetic field coming through the sun in these huge patches. Again, the black and the white is showing magnetic field towards and away from us. This would be a sunspot. But this is exactly the same size region somewhere away from a sunspot. And you can see there is still lots of very small-scale magnetic field. So the magnetic field breaks through the surface in a lot of places, and it breaks up. So the magnetic field is actually threading the surface almost all over the place. So what do we look like at? So what do we look at? This is a particular model. It's going to change, well, here it changes to the model, of a colleague who looks at how the global magnetic field, he's not interested in small-scale details, how does this global big magnetic field breaking through the surface in the sunspots change over time? So again, he has a model. These are kind of mimicked sunspots rotating around the sun. How does it change over time? Now, why would he want to know that? Well, because we kind of live in sight, this solar atmosphere. It doesn't just stop somewhere. The Earth carves its own little bubble out within the sun's atmosphere. So he's trying to model this huge, big global magnetic field so we can understand it. That's the very larger scales. We can go to very, very small scales. Remember, this is a similar movie as we saw before. It just shows the very lowest part of magnetic loops, 
So these are not just bits sticking up, these are actually the legs of very big magnetic loops, and you can see how they're constantly jostling around all the time. So what we do is we try and make models, very simple models. Okay, what's being shown here? Let's try and start that again. There's a white and a black patch, okay? They represent two very small fragments of magnetic field, like those patches you saw coming through the surface, but it's just two of them rather than lots. And all this experiment does is move these patches past each other. That's it. It's easy. Okay, well, what happens? You can ignore the blue and the red, that's not important, but look at this blue kind of shaded surface. That is current, because if you move magnetic fields, you generate a current. What are you going to do with currents? Currents mean heating. Okay? So all this jiggling around the magnetic field, that's what we think heats up this outer atmosphere. And this is a very similar experiment, really. It's just a different way of jiggling the field around. Instead of just moving two patches around each other, these are taking to this experiment, takes two patches. Imagine that this is a white one and that one is a black one up there, and it's just twisting them slightly. And again, it means you generate currents, which will be related to heating the solar atmosphere. So all this jostling, constantly jostling around magnetic field, that's what we think transfers the energy from the convection out into the solar atmosphere and eventually generates heat, which is why this atmosphere is incredibly hot. Because I don't know if we've really emphasized this, but it's not supposed to be hot. Because if you think about it, let's imagine that that was the nuclear core of the sun. I don't think the, radi the radiators are slightly warm, actually. Um, that was the nuclear core. That's where the heat is generated. And I now walk away towards the surface. And it's not actually colder here, but you know, you have to use your imagination. It's cooled down because I've walked away from the radiator. Now ignore the fact that there's a radiator over there as well. I keep walking, and all at once, it's an awful lot hotter. Okay? I started off at 15 million degrees. I got down to about 6,000. And by the time I was over here, I'm back at millions of degrees. Somehow, that energy had to be transferred all the way from the core. And we think that happens through the magnetic field that's anchored in this convection layer. And by constantly having these small shuffling motions generating currents and waves, although I'm not going to talk much about waves, we think you transfer that magnetic energy into heating. Now, you take this magnetic field and you're constantly annoying it, quite frankly. It just doesn't get a minute's peace. It sits there with its feet anchored in this convection re region. You're constantly stressing it and tangling it up. You saw all these small-scale motions. They generate currents. But occasionally, the field just becomes incredibly twisted and tangled until you've just pushed it beyond breaking point. You know, when people really keep annoying you, eventually, the energy is too much and it has to be released. And those type of very energetic explosions is what solar flares are. You have sought so much stress and energy in the field that it literally erupts. And again, Lindsay Fletcher will tell you an awful lot more about that. There's just one little taster of what a flare looks like, but it's this huge energetic event. This again is just a small portion of the sun. Now flares are huge energetic events and sometimes, not always, but most of the time, they lead to a coronal mass ejection. And here I'll show you a movie as well on the next slide, but here are some stills of one of these coronal mass ejections. So this is the full sun, and you can see this huge eruption, ejection of material. And I hope you can see it, but this is the Earth come in size to scale. Not in the right position. Luckily enough, we're a bit <laughs> further away, okay? So it's not quite where we are, but the scaling, the relative scaling is correct. Just, you know, they're kind of quite big. And it's probably a good thing we're rather far 
away. So again, this is, this is actually a picture of the chromosphere here. So what's going on here? Okay, so this is a picture of, it's similar to that one, of the chromosphere, but it's superimposed. The picture in the background, you can see this strange disk here. Well, that is an artificial solar eclipse. You basically just put a disk, we rely on, I, it's, it's great being a scientist, because you can just say, we just put a disk in front of the telescope, and some very clever engineer somewhere has sorted this all out for us. So you put this disk, you just do it, you just put this disk in front of the telescope, which again means you can see the outer atmosphere. Okay, and then someone has superimposed this picture again, so you can see what the sun would have looked like behind this disk. So this is the sun, and there's a bit we can't see because the disk is covering it. But then this is the coronal mass ejection coming out and traveling out into space. So let's have a look what that actually would look like. Oh, no, this is one of my favorites. Sorry, I did stick an extra picture in because it's one of my favorite pictures because of the incredible detail you can see here. And again, it is the Earth to scale. So I thought it's quite a good thing. We're a little bit further away than this. So again, remember, it's not where we are. It's just for illustrative purposes. But this is a movie. Watch up here, OK? Just look what's going to happen in that corner. There we go. And the whole thing just gets blasted into space, OK? So what happens is that eventually the magnetic field there became so stressed that it went unstable and it uh, erupted. And there you go. OK, so we'll let it go once more. Again, the temperatures here are the chromosphere, which is probably somewhere between 10, 50,000. So just watching Lindsay not, not because she knows much more about the chromosphere than I do. Uh, about 10,000 degrees plasma that you're looking at here. And there it goes. Now, these coronal mass ejections are incredibly violent events. Thank you, Jocelyn. And they're not exceptional in any way whatsoever. So let's have a look at this movie. It is an even further zoomed out view of the atmosphere. This little circle is what the sun would be. There's a disk blocking the immediate environment out so that we can see further out. You can see in the background, you can actually see the stars passing further in the sky. And then you can see that this movie runs for nearly two weeks. OK, so it doesn't quite happen at this speed. It's obviously incredibly speeded up. But what you can see is this huge blast constantly going on. And around solar maximum, there can be up to about three of these big coronal mass ejections every day. Now they, oh, is it going to play again? Ah, maybe I forgot to loop that one. You know what, if I go back, can I go back? Yeah, let's go forward. OK, this is actually a planet passing nearby, so it's not a UFO, it looks like it, it's nice, but it's not. It's just passing in front, or it's just passing in the field of view. But you can constantly see these huge blasts going off. And they go in all directions. The sun is a three-dimensional object, and it doesn't really choose in which direction it's going to send these things. So very occasionally, that happens. See that? That was one of these mass ejections that was directed towards the Earth. And what you saw was the... Oh, let's try and go back. I'm really sorry, I didn't loop this one. What you see when the detector gets completely hit by all these energetic particles. It is literally the coronal mass ejection hitting the satellite and traveling past the satellite. So I'll wait for that. But you can see that they happen constantly, and there were one or two... That one must have been a particularly bad one that hit the telescope. And that is one of the reasons why we would like to be able to predict these events for longer than the travel time it takes from the sun to the Earth. One of the things we would like to be able to do is protect satellites, because actually when you have a particularly violent event, it can cause quite a bit of damage. So that was coronal mass ejections. I only have one more topic before I am finished. Apart from these very dynamic and very eruptive events, there's actually a continuous stream of matter. Much more gently, you get this impression that stuff is constantly flowing out. Well, it is. There is stuff constantly, material constantly flowing out, which is known as the solar wind. Now, one illustration is that comet tail that gets swept around. As you see the comet, 
coming round the sun, its tail is swept around. Because despite the fact that the comet is still traveling in this direction, the solar wind blowing past it sweeps its tail ahead of it. And the way to think of that is you can run along the street, but if you're wearing a scarf or if you have long hair, it can actually blow ahead of you if the wind is strong enough. So no matter how fast you're running, your hair or your umbrella quite often as well, <laughs> or your scarf is actually ahead of you because the wind is going faster than you are running. And that's what's happening to this comet's tail. It is literally being blown past it. And that's one of the reasons why we know that there is such a thing as a solar wind. Or that's one way of illustrating that there is a solar wind. I hope you can stay for Jim Wilde's talk, because he will tell you what goes on or how we are affected by these dynamic, violent coronal mass ejections, but also by the more gentle solar wind. So I only have one final slide, which I don't really need to talk about. This is what the sun looked this morning around, what does it say? It says 0518 UT. I didn't get up that early. It must have not downloaded them. But I did download them this morning, because as I said, a lot of these images, in fact, almost all of them, are publicly available on the internet. So this is the sun at about a million degrees, and you can see it's looking very quiet just now. Looks like there's an active region coming just over the limb with some nice loops, and it looks like one has just gone over the limb on the other side. But apart from that, there's not an awful lot going on. In fact, this is the, the equivalent of the yellow pictures I've been showing with the sunspots. Uh, there's a suspicious lack of sunspots. In fact, it looks entirely white. There seems to be nothing going on. Um, and here on this side, the temperatures would gradually be going hotter. And you can see the sun is starting to look quieter just now as we are on our way to solar minimum. If you would like to find out more, I have a whole host of websites. But the one I would particularly like to highlight is the SunTrack page. SunTrack page is written by UK solar physicists. Well, we provide the material, and then some very clever people who are very good at presenting things uh, turn it into the SunTrack page. And you can literally find material there for any age group, from very small children up to anybody who would like to know more about the sun. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Enika, for a lovely talk and spectacular illustrations. We have time for a few questions, if members of the audience have questions. I've got one just to start us off. I don't think you said what kind of size of magnetic fields we have. On the ah, sun. that's true. Um, as it breaks through these sunspots, so the, the areas where you see the sunspots, it can be thousands of Gauss, because we still measure the magnetic field in Gauss. Now, I'm, look, I'm still looking at Lindsay because she's a physicist and can translate it into Tesla. A, a Gauss is about the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. Right. So thousands of times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field clumped into one of these small spots. Remember, they were actually quite big spots. By the time it comes around in the atmosphere, it's probably about 100 maybe tens of Gauss by the time you're at these loop tops. So it's actually a very weak magnetic field compared to the magnetic field we have. Enrique, so. that, that was a wonderful presentation. And I love the way it makes diagrams, stills, and activity. It reminds me that Lynn Margulis said, the only way I can teach biology is to have two projectors, one that's moving all the time and one that gives the diagrams. And you combine them both brilliantly. Um, I want to ask you a question, or all of the people presenting today, and, and Jocelyn. Uh, you know, um, many uh, traditional cultures in the past, prehistoric cultures, had a giveaway. The sun was the ultimate giveaway, and they replicated it by giving away the things in their culture. And we're 93 million miles away from the sun, and it gives us the heat and the photons, uh, which are positive. 
what percentage of the giveaway that the sun gives away every day to the universe or you know the solar system or beyond do we live on what percentage i mean Oof. it's if you can do the maths no uh, not, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's 93 not million miles away and it's our arc i just wanted it's a question but for not you but anyone and there is a number for the total Tom. One part in 10 billion, if you take the area of the Earth's orbit, complete sphere, and look at the disk, the amount of the sunlight actually coming on the Earth, is, I think it's about one in 10 billion. So, so that means uh, there could be 10 billion other planets in uh, giving, uh, you know, living off this one sun if they didn't yeah. hit each other. It would, it would get busy here, but... <laughs> um. Um, if I could just say to Charles, I, I was honoured uh, to present a my bit on Naim Gaba with Sam Edgerton from Harvard, who had worked with the, the astronomers at Harvard. And so my, my question is coming from this experience. Can you please clarify to me, a non-astronomer, the images you're getting, you're, you're recording in the extreme ultraviolet or whatever. So this is coming down as digital information, I take it? Yes. Numbers? I, yes. So, well, digital numbers, binary or whatever. Um, so you have to apply the aesthetics. You have to apply the colours. These are false coloured images. Sorry, I uh, really uh, thank uh, you for and, pointing well, that well, out. This, this, this was what was the exact uh, uh, you know discussion of the paper that it was actually the College Art Association in, in 1992, and, and, and this was fascinating for an art historian, what do, uh, or a layperson. You know what are we actually looking at? Uh, you, know, you, you did the thing on the scale and the placement of the Earth vis-a-vis -vis the Sun. But this question of the aesthetic of the images that you apply to it, is that now standardized in some way yes. across, across it, astronomy? Um, across astronomy? No, across astronomy. astronomy. We, we are applying some form of, and we're trying to <laughs> apply some form of standardizing across solar physics. So I really should have pointed this out. Thank you for bringing it up. These are all artificial colors. The sun does not emit in some kind of purple, and I don't know who was in charge of choosing that somewhat strange yellowy, greeny color. Um, we used to just all color it whatever way we liked, personal preference. You've got papers with pink suns and papers with turquoise ones. Um, and then I think slowly a, a kind of standard came. Um, to associate certain wavelengths with certain colors, so people could just look at the picture and go, oh, yeah, I know that um, corresponds to about one million degree plasma. What is done for this particular satellite is this particular satellite takes simultaneous images in a range of wavelengths so that we see a range of temperatures at the same time, because again, at different temperatures, it looks quite different. And the instrument team in this case made a decision on the colors. And they look somewhat weird combinations. You kind of look at them and you think, wow, what were you thinking? The reason they picked the combinations is because sometimes they combine them. So this particular one is actually a combination of this one, this one, and I believe if I can see it well, this one. And so they merged them so you can see as much as you can because you can't merge too many at the same time because it just becomes a mess. But you can just see the range of temperatures because that's what really these colors would correspond to. So they've basically chosen colors that combine relatively well in this particular case, but I don't think it's been standardized across astronomy. That would probably be useful. How do you get all this information? How do I get all this information? Again, this is a fantastic question with a very long answer if I want to. These particular images, I downloaded them. Google. The center of the sun, how do you know? Ah, well, I'm going to refer you to Yvonne's talk for that because those were not images. Those were cartoons, people doing drawings. These particular images, you just download off the internet. Getting the actual data, okay, because we don't actually work with the colored pictures. We go back to those numbers to really analyze things. This particular satellite takes all these images simultaneously. It does that every 12 seconds, all day long, seven days a week. And it has done so for a long, long time. What I'm trying to say is that the data volume is 
astronomical, to use that word. <laughs> so, this particular satellite is actually built by Lockheed Martin, who are out in California. Getting the data from them, I mean, there are mechanisms, we've put infrastructures in place, but actually the volume of data is unbelievable. It also means that the field is forced to develop or to start developing automated ways of analyzing events and things that are going on. Because actually the volume of images and data taken is too much for human beings to look at. So we have to teach, and we have to teach, we have to write computing programs and teach computers to recognize certain phenomena so that we can build a database. And we then look at the database rather than the originals. So you have to build a, you have to start writing computer programs and make sure to get it right, because if it's full of false positives or false negatives, the database is useless. So it's an entirely separate branch of solar physics, born just because we've managed to design a satellite that takes data quicker than we would be able to keep up with. And that, again, as astronomy develops, is only getting worse, if I can use that word. <laughs>